Okay, in this video, I'm going to be reading you a few pages from Jordan Maxwell's, Maxwell's book, That Old Time Religion. It also has Paul Tice and Alan Snow, and I'm going to start with Paul Tice, page 31. The lunar cult followed the stellar cult. This was at the point when time itself was kept track of by the moon rather than the stars. I tend to think that some knowledge was lost because in order to reckon time by using the stars I believe you must have a more advanced system of things looking up at the moon and determining cycles by the moon alone was a rather easy process compared to using the stars for example the stellar cult was able to determine the length of the great year which lasted in cycles of 25,827 years you cannot do this by using the moon alone he goes on to talk about Hathor the divine mother and Horus Kensu, the Divine Sun, and Cosmic Time Keeping. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because I don't. I want you to know you should buy it yourself. I'm just giving you my opinion on it. I don't want to steal the guy's work. So we go on to lunar symbols. The two gods, Horus and Set, continued their duality in the lunar cult. Each represented two different phases of the moon. Set was the dark half and Horus was the light half. One representing the waxing and one the waning of the moon. In the lunar cult, we have for the first time represented as the slayer of the evil dragon, the woman, or mother goddess. It was the son of the mother goddess who helped her in the, this process as more of a follower than the slayer himself. One of the animals that represents the moon to us today is the hair of the rabbit. This hair was actually preceded in Egypt by both the frog and the grasshopper. Remember I told you about Bugs Bunny and the rabbits. That's that connection. And I go on to... The Solar Cult by Jordan Maxwell. Let me read you. Um, let me see if we find something that pertains to my notes specifically. Here we go. The Prince of Darkness. Hence, evil is the dark or devil. Okay? Light was good, dark was bad. I am the light and the truth. We should give thanks to the Father for sending us his Son, for the peace and tranquility he brings to our life is even called Solus, from Solar, the Sun. So it's talking about how God's evil brother is the moon. Okay, so he's talking about how the moon embodies the fact that God is evil. And I'm going to show you one picture and move on to the next book. Next book, excuse me. This is God, Son on his boat, with the halo and all. Remember, there's a solar boat, as well as arcs, and cherubs, cherubin. And we go on, um, I'm going to leave Maxwell alone, as much as I'd love to explore further, in more depth what I meant, I'm going to move on to Peter Clayton, Great Figures of Mythology. And I'm going to start with page 78. And Leo, Lord Wind of the principal gods of Mesopotamian pantheon. He's one of the principal gods of the Mesopotamian pantheon. Worshipped especially in his temple Eker in the city of Nippur, his parentage is variously given as Anu, chief of the gods of the primal gods Enki and Ninki. Many of the more important gods are described as the offspring, including Ishtar, Inanna, Sin, Nena, Nergal, and Nirnata. Nin Gursu is his prime son, and she Masa, Utu, his wife. Remember, I talked about these gods in my first Illuminati video a little bit. I told you I was going to get into these more later, but well, here's more of my promises coming true. He is praised above all as a cosmic administrator. Talk about Ninil. Okay. His wife is usually Ninil, although the grain goddess soon has the status in some contexts. He is praised above all as cosmic administrator and the power in the storm. In the mythological passages, he is a creative benevolent god, but in the myth Enlil and Ninlil, he rapes the young Ninlil, thus begetting Nena Suen, and is banished from Nipur to the underworld as a sex criminal. He is followed by Ninil and takes the form of three different men. They meet on the journey to lie with her again, each time in danger, engendering another 
underworld deity. In the cuneiform flood stories, it is Enlil who takes the decision to destroy mankind. And there's also Inki. And it says Siena. Ia. Okay, so now I'm going to go on to... So there's a lot of gods I'm skipping over on purpose because I don't want to ruin it for you. The book, and I want to steal their work. I just want to cite them in a few places. Which actually is good for them. Because it helps you, you know, encourages you to buy the book. But anyway, we go on to Jupiter. The Roman equivalent of Zeus, he came to hold the predominant position in the Roman pantheon, appearing as the god of the sky, of daylight, of the weather, and particularly of thunder and lightning. He came to hold this position partly through his identification with Zeus, and partly through the assistance he offered Romulus in driving back the Sabines. Romulus established a temple to Jupiter at the spot where he had first implored his assistance. With his temple on the capital, Jupiter was seen in the supreme power whose priest, Flamin Dialis, was married to the priest S. of Juno, Flaminca. It was to Jupiter that newly elected consuls offered their first prayers, and it was he who oversaw international relations through the mediation of the College of Priests. The establishment of a capital similar to that at Rome in every provincial city affirmed that political bond between Rome as mother city and the daughters, which were all a copy of her. So many of these ancient cultures, science and religion, were part of the same temple. They are studied in the same place. So college, medicine, and religion were all intertwined and mixed together. So we go on. Kepri, in Egyptian mythology, the scarab 